Hey everyone, it is your girl Lizzie Yayo Forever Keeping in the Bando and the Hype Magazine. And on today we have an extraordinary guest by the name of Lenny Williams. How you doing, Lenny? I'm doing good, Lizzie. How you doing? I am well. So um, can you please tell us who you are and what it is that you've done and what you do? Well, I am Lenny Williams. I'm a Leonard and Mildred's uh, baby boy. And uh, I'm a singer, songwriter. Uh, I started singing in church a long time ago, but uh, but I'm known for, uh, in, in the 70s, I was in a band called Tower Power. And we had a few hits uh, during that time period. Then I left the band. And then I recorded a song called uh, Cause I Love You. Girl, you know I love you. Know, everybody loves that song. And uh, Steve always says it's the greatest love song ever. And then, uh, you know, I've uh, been sampled by uh, Jay-Z, by uh, uh, Kanye West, Twista, you know, so many different people. I'd be here all day naming all the people that sampled me, right? And, uh, you know, recorded with uh, Kenny G, had hits with him on the 16 million seller, Don't Don't Make Me Wait For Love, uh, and just written songs for a lot of people. And, uh, you know, so that's that's me in a, in a nutshell, so to speak. Yes, that's beautiful. Now, can you um, give me a more in-depth, like, where where it all started from, where you from, and um, where you've been in your accomplishments? Okay, well, I, uh, I I was born in Little Rock, Arkansas. I came out to California when I was uh, about 18 months old, so I was told. And then uh, started in church, you know, and I went to church with, uh, as a teenager, I went to church with Walter Hawkins, uh, Ed Hawkins, uh, Jermaine Hawkins, uh, the Stewart family, Sly and the Family Stone, Sly and all his brothers and sisters, uh, 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 Billy Preston, uh, Andre Crouch. So I grew up in the church and, uh, you know, and then I started playing trumpet and graduated from high school and uh, uh, went to college with Huey Newton and Bobby Shield, the Black Panther Party, uh, decided to, uh, you know, kind of, uh, spread my wings a little bit and leave the church. And, uh, but I realized that God had given me a great talent. And so I said, well, I'm not gonna use it in the church. I'll use it uh, singing the secular music. And that's how I got started doing that. And, uh, you know, I've been all around the world, you know, singing and doing my thing. And uh, so right now I've, I've been doing a lot of Southern soul music uh, with King George, people like that, Tucker, Pokey Bear. And so that's been a lot of fun uh, for me to do that kind of changed my style a little bit uh, from, you know, basic R&B. And so, you know, uh, you know, just still learning music and performing and just having a, having a good time doing it. Right. Now, um, for the ones that don't know, is it that you, did someone is discover you? Did you audition or anything like, just for the ones that don't know? Well, you know, I grew up in Oakland, so there's a lot of stuff that was happening, right? And so, uh, you know, Sly Stone, was, was, they were from here, and I hooked up with Larry Graham, the bass player for Sly and the Family Stone, did a lot of stuff with Prince, and uh, just kind of hooked up with him. And uh, and then I was at a club one night singing, and then a guy from a record company happened to be there. I was like, hey, you want to make a record? I'm like, yeah, so why not, you know? And so that's kind of how I got started. And, uh, you know, they just kind of took it from there, just going around, just meeting people. You know, Carlos Santana, you know, he grew up, uh, you know, right across the bay in San Francisco. So, you know, just hanging out. You know, every time somebody was hanging out, going to the studio or something, you know, I find my way to, you know, to weasel my way in there. And then after a while I got known, everybody started knowing who I was. Hey, what's up, Lenny? And you know, what you doing? And start writing with people. And eventually, you know, uh, you know did a record in 1973. and went number one it's like oh i'm in now you know so just kept on rolling yeah i've been rolling for 50 something years now yeah oh, that's so beautiful now how did that song come about well uh a couple friends of mine wrote that song uh, so very hard to go yeah right a couple friends of mine uh wrote that and uh actually they had written it for somebody else and uh i was hanging out with them one saturday night and uh and they were sh showing it off to me and then, uh, then they call me that Monday and say, "Hey, we're gonna take this guy off of it and put you on if you want to." I'm like, "Yeah, I'm on my way," you know. And uh, so that's how that happened. Yeah. Oh, that is awesome. Um, what kept? Well, of course, you making getting the hit kept you going, but what motivated you 
to continue? Like, did you have a goal that you set in place when you started? Yeah, I mean, basically, I just wanted to sing, you know, but then I had two kids and I had two sons. And then that like that really motivated me because, you know, they needed that milk. They need to go to school, need to close the school. They need tutoring and all that kind of stuff like that. So then, uh, you know, just uh, so I just started like, you know, they needed to be in a better neighborhood, you know, and so uh, for better schooling and safety and things like that. So being a father really just motivated me to keep on going in my music and just keep on trying to, you know, to be triumphant, you know, so not only could uh, uh, I provide for my family, but I could, uh, you know, let my let my kids see that uh, that anything that you set your mind to do, if you if you work hard at it and make sacrifices, that you can accomplish anything that you want. Right. I, obviously, you keep going. You stay consistent. It's right. bound to happen. Mm -hmm. um, growing up in Little Rock, Arkansas, is that where you? That's where you grew up, right? Well, I was born there, but I, I basically grew up in Oakland, California. Yeah, uh, in yeah. Oakland, California. Okay, how did that? How did the change in surroundings uh, help mold your experience? Well, you know, Oakland was a real interesting city because it had an army base, a navy base, so you had people coming from all over the the country, you know, the guys in the army and the Navy. And uh, so uh, it, had, uh, it was close to Mexico. So you had Latino influence. Of course, you had the European white influence. And, uh, you know, we had Southern influence because there's so many black people was migrating from the South over to, you know, to the Northern and, and Western states like that. And so had a lot of, a lot of influences uh, it, as far as music was concerned. And then politically had a lot of influences. You know, Angela Davis was out here had, uh, you know, the, like I said, Huey Newton and and uh, Bobby Seale from the Black Panther Party. So there was a lot of things going on, a lot of influences uh, that helped me grow consciously, you know, and politically, even spiritually, you know, there had a lot of churches and things like that. And so uh, I just got my eyes and ears open and uh, tried to decipher, you know, or, or understand a, uh, as much of, you know, the the noise or the, the rhetoric uh, that was, you know, coming out and then uh, then basically trying to make my own decisions about what I wanted to do or what I wanted to believe in. Right. Um, you said that you played the trumpet in school. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, I'm sorry? No, no. Yeah, I played trumpet in school. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay. So, and you sang in um, the gospel choir. Now, did that play a crucial, uh, crucial role in your music? Oh yeah, most definitely. I mean, uh, you know, singing the gospel songs, uh, you know, gave me all the little runs and everything like that. And and so, uh, and then I just met so many people, you know, that were you know, doing music, you know, I, you know, like I said, I met, you know, the Hawkins family, you know, they, you know, and, and they were, you know, doing music and then, you know, uh, Billy Preston, Andre Crown, so many different people, Sly Stone. So, the, so definitely it influenced my, my music and then I listened to so much music on the radio, so much gospel music on the radio that uh, it uh, it influenced me listening to Sam Cooke and all the quartet singers and things like that. And so uh, Oakland had you know, a lot of a lot of quartet singing, and uh, and so I used to go to all of that. And then so you know you listen to a lot of things, and then eventually, you know, you kind of develop your own style. And that's a fact. Um, joining. Tower Power in 1972 marked a significant chapter in in your career, right? Right. Um, what was the most memorable moment for you? Well, I think I had a bunch of memorable moments, but I think that the most memorable moment was hearing my record on the radio. You know, like you know, we just driving down the street with my boys, and then all of a sudden, bam! You know, there I was, and then you know, they said, "Oh man, turn the channels." You know, they'd be giving me. The, Teaser, we turn the channel, we turn the channel, there it is over there. You know, it's like no matter what channel we turn it to, it's like you, we can't get away from it, you know. And so that was real memorable. And then I remember uh, doing the uh, Soul Train, you know, uh, going on Soul Train because you know, we had a big band and everybody that went on Soul Train had to lip sync. And so we were telling uh, Don Cornelius that we didn't, he wanted us to come on real bad. We was like, no, but we don't want to lip sync, we want to do it live. And uh, so that's, you know, real complicated you know, to do a live band, you know, uh, 
And, and so uh, he was real resistant to us. So finally, you know, he gave in and we did that. So that was like a great achievement. And uh, I mean, singing at the Rose Bowl one time, you know, they have about 100,000 people there. And then they have like 85 million people watching you on television. And so, uh, you know, that was real memorable. So, you know, it's just a lot of memorable moments with the, you know, Tower Power and uh, you know, and getting my first royalty check and bought my first house, you know. So, <laughs> you know, so that was all good too, yeah. Most definitely. So um, with your solo career, when it took off because of, because I love you mm -hmm. and choosing you. Can you share the inspiration behind these songs and what they mean to you personally? Well, choosing you was the first, I was learning how to play guitar. And so uh, that was the first song that I wrote by myself playing the guitar. So that was real, real special to me. And I, uh, and I always think, wow, you know, uh, all the time and effort that I put in to, to learn how to play guitar, and then I could write my first song all by myself, and uh, and it became a hit. And uh, Cause I Love You was real interesting because I had a friend of mine that was, uh, well, I had met him and he became a friend, but he was a carpenter and he would work on my house and do different things that I wanted around the house. And he kept telling me that he had a son that could sing and dance and play music. And I was like, everybody think their kid's good, right? And so then, uh, he, he kept kept on after me. So finally I said, okay, let me meet your son. So his son came by and his son was all of that. He was really, really good. And so him and I started writing and he was, uh, his son was uh, quite a bit younger than me. And he said, well, he had to be inspired to write, you know, something had to happen, you know? And I was like, well, if you was writing for Motown, those guys go to work every day. They eight o'clock, they punching in and, and they sit there all day over at Motown and they write songs and Barry Gordy come through, see what's going on. And I said, this, you know, the inspiration is getting that check every week or whatever, right? And so uh, and so I kind of tried to get him to buy into that theory. And so one day he came by the house, you know, it was time for us to write, and I, I didn't feel like it. And he's like, oh, man, if you working for Barry Gordy, what, what you going to do? What you going to say? And uh, so I said, okay, let's write. And I, I had a, he said, why you don't feel like writing? And I said, well, because me and my girl got into it last night. And he said, well, let's write about that. And that's how Cost I Love You came, you know. Girl, you know I love you. Uh, you know, came through. Yeah. Awesome. Well, that's a great inspiration. Yeah. There. Um, working with Motown Records in 1975, and later moving to ABC Records in 1977. How did that change? How did the change in record label labels uh, influence your music and well, your artistic uh, freedom? Yeah. Well, I was at the. Uh, uh, I was at Tower Power, right? I was with Tower Power and I left Tower Power and I went to Motown and I put out a record at Motown and it didn't hit. And then I was like, oh boy, you know, you know, I was, I was dejected, right? And then I'm just kind of wondering if it's going to, it's going to happen, you know? And so then uh, I, I talked to Suzanne DePass and I asked her if I could leave the company uh, and I just wanted to kind of just explore and, and, and just think. And she said, do you have something else you want to do in particular? I was like, no, I don't really have anything, but I just, I just, if I feel free, then maybe, you know, new music or something will come to me. So then I came up with some new music. I went over to uh, ABC and I hooked up with Frank Wilson, who had been the, uh, the writer and producer for Eddie Kendricks, you know, one of the tempta original Temptations and wrote that song, Boogie Down Baby and Keep On Trucking. And Eddie had a couple of number one hits. So I hooked up with Frank and then bam, you know, just hit, you know, it's like, oh my goodness. And so then, then I was writing and Frank liked all my music and then he was taking it and, you know, rearranging it and making it sound really good. So that was just like a perfect marriage for me. And uh, it just really, really worked. And what, what was the name of that song that hit? Well, it was choosing you, and then I had a uh, uh, song, uh, "Look Up with Your Mind." Uh, you got me running. Uh, so many different songs, and then we did "Cause I Love You" over there with Frank. Cause I had done "Cause I Love You" uh, at Motown, but I didn't have the talking in it, and it was a little faster. So Frank slowed it down, put the talking in it, and then uh, Andre Crouch he came to the studio when I was singing that song, and so him and his sister, uh, and they came, and I was like, I wanted to kind of make Andre shout or something, you know, I was trying to make him feel good. 
because he's you're like the number one gospel singer. So I said, I'm gonna make old Andre and his twin sister Sandra, I'm gonna make them get the shouting in the studio. And so then I started to put all the passion and then I could in that song. And everybody said, Where all that passion come from? I said, because I was Andre Cross is looking at me while I sang that song. Okay. I'm glad you look, I know you've answered a lot of people's questions of where the passion came from, just right there. Yes, uh, most definitely. Yes. So your hit, Don't Make Me Wait for Love, with Kenny G in 1986 became a major success. Mm -hmm. How did this collaboration come about, and what was the experience like working with him? Well, I was riding down the street, and this was before cell phones, and my beeper went off. Beep, beep, you know? And so I stopped at the phone booth, and I called the, the, the person that beat me. I think it was uh, Clay Tobin Richardson or either Larry Baptiste. They, uh, they, they did a lot of arrangements for Charlie Wilson's uh, songs and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, that's what they do now, but uh, and all kinds of stuff. But they, uh, at that time, they're just songwriters around Oakland. And so they called me and said, hey, Narda Michael Walden wants you to call him. And Narda was producing Aretha Franklin, uh, producing Shania Twain and, Mariah, he was producing everybody, right? And so I was like, okay, let me call Narda. So then I dropped some money in the phone booth and called Narda. And he was like, yeah, I'm, I'm producing Aretha for Clive Davis. And he said, he's got this guy that plays saxophone uh, named Kenny G and said he used to be produced by, I think, uh, Scott, I can't think who he's producing, but, uh, and he hadn't had a hit. And they said, if he don't have a hit this time, they're gonna drop him. So I was thinking because you sang in Tower Power and they had all the horns and everything, that'd be a good combination. So I went over and uh, and I met with them and uh, we got the song and we did it. And uh, bam, next thing I know, it's all over the world, you know, it was on the album, sold 16 mil million copies. And, uh, you know, so it was just, uh, thank God I had a beeper. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> So, um, Cause I Love You has been sampled multiple times, mm -hmm. including by Havoc and Mob Deep, the Kanye West. How do you feel about your music continuing to influence and resonate with the new generation? I mean, I love it. I mean, I love it because it, uh, you know, it, uh, I was just looking on, on the internet the other night and, and some little boy, I guess he was like about four and he was singing the song. His mama was giving him the words and he was singing it and he was getting down. And I was like, wow, just, to think that you know that my music is touching people you know that young you know and and, and from there in between all the way up and so it's just, I mean it's it's humbling you know and then uh, it keeps the music alive and uh, then if you handle your business you know and you got your publishing and all your writing credits and and you got that all locked down. Uh, I'd be loving to see the mailman come by, you know, <laughs> you know, those those, those uh, royalty checks and everything like that. And then it's something that I can leave to my kids, you know, I mean, and so and, and my grandkids and things like that. So it's just been a blessing, not only from the point of view, the artistic point of view, that that your music is just resonating with uh, so many generations of people uh, and they love the music. But, you know, still that, that's taken care of me, you know, and. Uh, you know, sometimes, you know, you just, just be, uh, I'll just be amazed at how much residual money I, I make off of songs that I wrote, you know, 40, 45 years ago. And it's just, uh, you know, uh, good to be a business business person. Just keep your eyes open. And that, that's, you know, that's so important, and especially in all business and especially in this business. Mm -hmm. I, like, did you know that it was going to be a hit or like, what do you think makes a hit? If I knew that, I'd have a hundred thousand hits. <laughs> right one right now. You know, I, I you know, I think every time you write a song, you think that it's good, you know. Uh and, and but uh, you know, then some things just stand out, you know, they they resonate with people, you know, people feel a co connection to it. You know, I've had guys tell me, you know, that you know, most men don't like to cry and they don't like want to seem weak, but because, you know, that song talks about, you know, man crying and, and uh, feeling weak and more that's kind of begging, uh, you know, so it's like, if you can't do it yourself, you know, you put on some Lenny Williams and Lenny Williams kind of does it for you, you know? And so I think that when, when you write something that uh, like, you, you know, you, you go downtown and you see a, a dress, you know, somebody made that dress and, you know, some designer. And, and if that 
uh, you look at it and you say, oh, girl, I'm going to go, you know, I'm going to go get that dress, you know, and, you know, maybe 40 people pass by and looked at that dress a day, but maybe four or five people that just touched them so much, they liked it so much that they said, I'm going to go get it, you know, so this is the same thing with music. You write something and it touches people and then they say, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go buy that record. I'm going to download that, you know, whatever, you know, you know, stream it. And, uh, and so that that's hope that's what you hope for that it touches somebody enough that they want to uh, buy it yeah that's right um your versatility extends beyond music with roles in stage plays like love on lay on layaway and what men don't tell how does your experience in acting complement your musical career well you know because i i'm primarily a a, a ballad singer and so uh so when you just you know, if you like Usher or Chris Brown, you can, you know, you can dance, you know, uh, so you, you're entertaining and, you know, you're moving around. So all of that plays into getting the song across. But if you're standing there, say like uh, People Bryson or somebody and, and or Will Downing and you're just singing, you know, you have to be able to, with facial expressions, uh, uh, with, you know, just being able to uh, enunciate the words, to pull people in and so so acting is kind of a natural transition and so i was fortunate enough to be in a couple of plays and uh, i think i first play i started out i was in and then i didn't have a lot of lines and then uh started doing more plays and then the next thing i know i was going to play with billy d williams and then i'm going to play with Tina arnold and there's so many different people and then you get the you know, you get a little nervous sometimes, you know, being around, you know, people that acting is their primary gig. But it's been fun. I like to do it. Yeah. yeah. How did you go get past um, being nervous? Well, I guess if, you know, if, if you want it bad enough, you just have to get past it. And then sometimes the nervousness helps you because it, you know, it, it uh, keeps you honest, you know. And so sometimes you can get so cocky that you oh i got the words i got down i, got, I know what to do and then you you know you, you you're carefree and and you're too carefree and then you know boom it's your moment and then you uh you know whatever and so but um i think a little bit of nervousness helps help artists i think you know just kind of keep them honest uh make them practice a little bit more good if they're really really sure but you don't want to get overly nervous to the point that you can't you know, uh, perform, you know, you definitely don't want that. Yeah. And then sometimes some people have to go to psychologists and psychiatrists to get on your knees and say one of them prayers, oh, Lord, help me, you know, something, I don't know, to get over your nervous with whatever you need to do. Yeah. Uh, right. Uh, you toured extensively in the U.S. and Europe and South of Africa. Is there a particular concert or performance that stands out the most memorable in your career? Ooh, now I've done a lot of different shows, but I tell you one time I had a, I got a phone call from Aretha Franklin's manager and said, Aretha is having a party. And so Aretha would have these parties and she would run out to like the theater, you know, uh, whatever big theater in, in like in Detroit, the Fox theater that might see 4,000 people, but she'd only invite about a hundred people and it'd be her family and her close friends. And so they get on the back of the stage and they have a big five course dinner and then they pull that curtain down. Then they all go out in the audience and then then she say, ladies and gentlemen, my good friend Lenny Williams is going to sing for you. And so, you know, you got the queen there, you know, and she, you know, she done invited her best friends, you know, you know, her good girlfriends and everybody and her family. And you got to perform. And uh, so that was a one time I, I, I did that for her three times. She kept on calling me back. And my wife's like, oh, I think Aretha like you. I said, oh, well, what can I say? You know what I mean? You know, but uh, I said, she liked my singing, that's for sure. But uh, yeah, so I have, I think that really stands out for me that the, you know, the queen of soul, somebody who was so talented that, um, you know, that she, she had something that was so personal to her, her family and her friends. And she called me three times to come and do that. So those, those moments really stand out uh, for me. Yes, that sounds beautiful. Okay. Um, with a career spanning several decades, how do you stay inspired and motivated to create and to continue to perform um, your music? 
Well, you know, uh, it's because I love it, you know, so that's great inspiration right there. And then, uh, you know, then watching and listening to all the new music that comes out, all the young people that are doing music, and it just inspires me. It inspires me to see somebody who is not known, you know, outside of their little town or whatever, what city they're in, and that they get in the studio with their friends and they grind and they grind, and the next thing you know, they, you know, they number one, and it's like, Wow, you know, it's like magic, you know, how that happens. And uh, so that that inspires me. Every time I see somebody new that's just just that comes up from nothing and 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 and, and you know become a star, it just uh, inspires me and it's like, wow, I could I can still do that if I, you know, if I put you know all the the right uh, ingredients together, you know, and uh, the right right song, right uh, marketing, uh you know, uh, right interview, you know, and all of that, you know, and, and so, you know, it's just, uh, it's just amazing to me. And then I just want to see if I can do that again, you know, so just the, uh, uh, you know, say like you in the Olympics and you run a race and you set a record and then you say, okay, then you go back to the next Olympics. You want to at least do as well or do better. You want to see if you can top that. So that's, that's the inspiration for me. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. I'm looking ahead. Are there any upcoming projects or collaborations that you're excited and able to share? Well, uh, this uh, young guy, King George, right now is really, really hot. And I've been doing some shows with him. And I talked to him about writing a song for me. So I'm looking forward to that and uh, really excited about that. And then I've been working with uh, a good friend of mine, uh, DOA. His name is Derek Allen. And uh, he produced the last two albums on the artist Kim. And so uh, him and I've been working together. And so I'm excited about uh, the, the songs that are gonna come out of that collaboration. So I'm just, you know, doing my thing every day, getting up, you know, and uh, trying to make it happen. Yeah. Period. I love that. Um, yeah. can, can you give some like words of wisdom for people that are up and coming? Yeah, well, I think you know, the, the main thing is be good at what you do, you know, uh, not be a, a celebrity uh, interviewer, you know, be the best that you can be if you're gonna be, uh, you know, uh, engineer, singer, songwriter, to be the best you can be. And then uh, try to find a, a good person, a good lawyer, good manager, somebody like that, that can, uh, you know, protect you and give you good advice. And um, I always tell people to stay away from substance abuse. Uh, you know, don't get caught up in that because, uh, you know, you put around embarrass yourself, you can put around mess up your talent, you know, by, you uh, you know, you're getting overtaken by, by substance abuse. And uh, I think it's good to be nice to people because, I mean, you could go to an office and somebody's sitting there, you know, when you walk in and they are uh, answering the phone and, uh, you know, greeting people and you be a little snotty to them because you just want to meet with the president. You come back three years later and they the president, you know, you're like, oh, so, so you just got to be nice to all the people that you meet because you just never know where they may wind up. And they may wind up in a place where they can help you or they can wind up in a place where, you know, they remember how mean and ugly you were and, and uh, just say next, you know, and, you know, so I think you know, those are the best pieces of advice that I give people. Yeah. Thank you so much. Can you let the world know where they can find you? Well, of course, they could just Google you, but. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm probably, uh, you know, um, I'm on Facebook at The Real Lenny Williams. Uh, I'm on TikTok. Just got on there. Just this week, uh, yeah, TikTok at the real Lenny Williams, uh, Instagram the real Lenny Williams, and uh, you know you can reach out to me. I, you know, I'm on it every day, you know, and responding and all of that stuff like that, and uh, saying hi and what's up, and uh, so yeah, just reach out to me, the real Lenny Williams. Yeah, I love it. Well, thank you so much. It was an honor to have you. Um, is there anything that you would like to say? Yeah, I'd like to say uh, to all to, to my audience, you know, the people uh, that the, I appreciate the support that people have given me over the years, you know, coming to the concerts, uh, buying the records, uh, now they're streaming and uh, all of that. And, uh, you know, calling the radio station saying I want to hear the, hear the record. And I want people to know that I really, really appreciate it. And I don't take it for granted. Amen. Well, thank you again. Hey, everybody, it's your girl, Lizzie Yeo, forever keeping in the bando with the legendary Lenny Williams. Y'all make sure y'all stay tuned. He got some new music coming out. And he's on TikTok, y'all. <laughs> yeah, I got a new song called She Took My Draws. Oh, I got to launch it down. It's on TikTok. <laughs>
It's on TikTok, uh huh. <laughs> okay, well, we're gonna tap into that for sure. Okay, it's all right. My it's my pleasure. Okay, bye now. My girl and I was at the motel on the rendezvous. Yeah.